Hey guys, welcome back to Iconoclast. Today we're getting into the world of vicinal diketones or VDKs, and we'll be exploring some cutting edge technology and yeast modification to combat diacetyl, which is a common off flavor in beer. This is actually an introduction video introducing the idea of a series we're doing. So we have three upcoming videos and each one will focus on a different Omega strain that has just come out. And these are known as DKO strains that use DKO and Lumina technology. And we'll talk about what that means. Specifically, we're going to be looking at Vasa Nova, which is OYL 407, West Coast One Plus, which is OYL 430, and German Lager One Plus, which is OYL 437. And we're gonna see how they perform with under modified malts that are high in VDK precursors. So stay tuned as we put these strains to the test and make sure you subscribe. Before we get started, I wanna give a huge shout out to our sponsor who supplied the yeast for this experiment, Atlantic Brew Supply in Raleigh, North Carolina. They're a valuable resource for brewers of all levels and whether you're a complete beginner or a professional, Atlantic Brew Supply offers ingredients, equipment, advice, and community support. If you're in the area, definitely visit their 3,500 square foot home brewing mecca in Raleigh, North Carolina, where they regularly host brewing classes, events of all types, everything fermented foods to how to brew all grain. So what are VDKs anyway? Vicinal diketones are flavor compounds in beer, with diacetyl being one of the most prevalent. Diacetyl is known for its sweet butter, caramel, or butterscotch flavor, and is formed during fermentation. And it can also be an indicator of bacterial contamination if it's present in excessive or unexpected amounts. So monitoring the levels of VDK in your beer is crucial for producing beer that meets the style's flavor profile and quality standards. So briefly, let's talk about the evolution of diacetyl awareness. Brewers' awareness and acceptance of diacetyl has evolved. In the 1950s, the average diacetyl level in American commercial beer was significantly higher than it is today. Modern brewing practices and malting techniques have reduced those levels. Although some styles, like we talked about in the ALDC video, which I highly recommend checking out if you're interested in taking a bit of a deeper dive into diacetyl production, as well as another way to prevent the formation of diacetyl. And you can find a link for that in the description. So how do VDKs form anyway? VDKs are not produced directly by yeast, but they do result from a long chain reaction during the synthesis of amino acids valine and isoleucine. Yeast cells excrete alpha acetolactate and alpha ketobutyrate, which are precursors to VDKs. These precursors break down spontaneously into VDKs, whose levels peak near the end of fermentation. When your beer is maturing, yeast is metabolizing VDKs reducing their levels, converting them into less flavor active molecules. If you rack your beer off yeast too soon, VDKs may reappear in the finished product. You may not remove all that diacetyl as well as other VDKs that we're not talking about right now. The key to managing diacetyl lies in the yeast's enzymatic activity, which converts diacetyl into less flavorful compounds. Now, we have four ways you can control diacetyl and other VDKs in your beer. The first goes way back and it's krausening. Okay, so krausening is adding actively fermenting beer to maturing beer, which is introducing fresh active yeast that then consumes the VDKs and metabolizes those precursors as well as any diacetyl that's popped up. Second, we have the diacetyl rest. This is what most brewers do today. So diacetyl rest involves increasing the fermentation temperature slightly midway to the end portion of your fermentation process. And that really speeds up the maturation of VDKs and allows the yeast to take up those off flavors. Next, we have ALDC, also known as alpha acetolactate decarboxylase. And this is another effective method to control diacetyl. And it works because it's an enzyme that actually converts alpha acetolactate directly to acetoin, the less flavorful compound, like we mentioned earlier, than diacetyl is. So you skip right over diacetyl and you, you take the precursors to diacetyl and move them straight to acetoin. So you don't get as much off flavor, if any. For a more in-depth look at ALDC, definitely check out our previous video where we deep dive into this subject. Now last, and this is what this series is going to be about, is yeast strain selection. So different yeast strains produce and reduce VDKs at varying rates. However, Omega has come up with some technology through genetic modification that allows yeast to 
exhibit an ALDC enzyme, which prevents the formation of diacetyl altogether without having to use any additional enzymes. So this sets the basis for our experiments that are coming in the next three videos. So let's talk a little bit about that genetic modification. In the quest to reduce diacetyl more efficiently, researchers have turned to genetic modification. By using CRISPR technology, scientists have developed Lumina technology, which revolves around removing the HZY1 gene, the hazy gene, from brewing yeast. The research and development team at Chicago's Omega Yeast Labs has made a groundbreaking discovery that links hazy beer to a specific gene, HZY1. By using gene editing technology known as CRISPR, the Omega Yeast team was able to delete this hazy one gene from haze positive strains, which results in beers that no longer produce haze. In Omega's words, this discovery blurs the line between yeast strains used for New England IPAs and traditional West Coast IPAs, allowing people to explore new flavor combinations. Next, we have DKO technology, and this is another genetically modified yeast technology. So DKO stands for diacetyl knockout, and it's a technology that, like we said, knocks out diacetyl formation before it starts. Any strain utilizing DKO technology expresses the ALDC enzyme. So the benefits of using DKO tech. One, you avoid diacetyl hangups with hop creep. In other words, if you experience hop creep, at least you won't have to worry about diacetyl production, even though this won't stop drying out of the beer. Second, it boosts quality and keeps tanks turning quickly. This is mostly applicable to pro breweries, but if you brew a lot like I do, this could be a big factor. And three, DKO makes diacetyl levels so low that they're undetectable. So the next question, why should I use a DKO strain as opposed to adding the enzyme ALDC? Well, the first reason I can think of is that ALDC is quite expensive. You might pay $35 for a small dropper bottle of it. Using a DKO enabled yeast strain lets you save time and money because it's already built into your yeast that you're buying anyways, and you don't have to worry about adding the enzyme separately. So it simplifies your brew day. Okay, so you know a little bit about VDK and some of the tech behind the newer yeast strains out there. How do you tell if your beer has VDK or a diacetyl? The answer is you use a forced VDK test. And this is simpler than it sounds. So what you do first, you take a sample collection, maybe two to three ounces of your beer. And this should be a beer that has been fermenting. It shouldn't be wort. This should be fermented. And you can use your sample port on your conical, or you could just use a wine thief from a carboy or bucket or whatever you might be using to collect this. So what we're doing here is simulating rapid aging of the beer. We're actually simulating what it would be like if you left this beer and let these precursors come out naturally. So you're gonna take the container that you collected with the beer in it, the two to three ounces, you're gonna put it in a water bath that is heated to 175 to 190 degrees Fahrenheit. And you're gonna leave it there for about 30 minutes. This process is converting any VDKs present to diacetyl. Next, we're gonna cool and test the sample. This is where you actually get to see if your beer has any diacetyl present. So after 30 minutes, you are going to cool the sample to room temperature and taste it. If the beer has no detectable buttery character or slick mouthfeel, it's probably ready for packaging. So you can keg it, you can bottle it, you can do whatever you need to do. However, if diacetyl is present, if you detect that, allow for more maturation time and possibly agitate the fermenter a little bit to resuspend some yeast. Hopefully that can help the yeast get back into suspension and clean up for you. And just repeat this process until your beer is free from diacetyl. That's really all there is to it. So it's pretty clear that brewers now have a lot of tools in their toolbox to ensure their beer is free from unwanted off flavors. Anything from traditional process all the way up through genetically modified yeast and everything in between. And that means we're getting consistently high quality beer, at least when it comes to VDKs. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe because you don't wanna miss the next three videos that will be experiments taking you through the outcomes of what it's like to use these yeasts and how well they work. And of course, don't forget to check out Atlantic Brew Supply if you're in the area or check out their website at atlanticbrewsupply.com. Definitely stay tuned for the next video where we will share the results of a lager strain that has been genetically modified with DKAO technology. Thanks for watching and never stop learning. Thank <laughs> you.